everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Joe Veselak. And I'm Jake Fisher. So today we're going to be talking about our first impressions of the Rivian R1S, which we bought for the CR Auto Test Program. Um, the R1S is basically a three-row SUV version of the R1T pickup that we have already finished testing. Um, and so like that one, it has four electric motors, one at each wheel, giving it all-wheel drive. It has an astounding 835 horsepower. And the driving range, the EPA says, is between 289 to 321 miles, depending on the wheel and tire package you get. Now, the one we're talking about today, the one we bought for the program, is actually a 2022, and it has an EPA estimated driving range of 316 miles with 21 inch wheels. Um, the R1S comes standard with all the good safety stuff and a bunch of driver assistance stuff, including automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection, automatic emergency braking that operates at highway speeds, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance, lane centering assistance, and adaptive cruise control. Pretty good, huh, Joe? Yeah. I was able to yeah. do all that. <laughs> um, so we purchased a 2022 R1S launch edition which had a, a base price of $75,500 with a few options and an $1,800 destination charge. Our vehicle cost $79,250, but a little backstory, which is that we, you know, with startup companies and everything, it was kind of interesting because we put our deposit on the R1S in late 2019. We weren't able to configure it until late 2022. That's when we were able to actually do, you know, make the truck order it the way we wanted. And then we took delivery of it in March of 2023. And we were kind of fortunate that we did put in that reservation so early because if we were to order that same truck now, instead of costing 79,000, it would cost about $95,000. That's how much things have gone up. So um, with that in mind, Jake, let's kind of start off the topic, the conversation really before we get into what it's like to drive this thing, but where, is the R1S as far as SUVs within the market? Like, wh who is it competing with? Who is it for? What is it for? Sure. So first of all, let's talk electric vehicles, right? Electric yeah. vehicles, well, there's Tesla and there's the rest of them. Yeah. And most electric vehicles are still Tesla. They really dominate the market. So Tesla, they have a, you know, a little variety of vehicles, right? They got the, the Model S, the Model Y. But the thing is, is that what they're missing, and they have, you know, quite a bit of sedans. And if anyone's been looking at the market lately, not a whole lot of sedans. Sedans aren't very popular. <laughs> That's true. So Rivian came up with a great idea. It's like, let's kind of do Tesla, but let's do it in the market that everyone is buying. So what is that? Simply pickup trucks, three row SUVs. And, and not Tesla Model X's with Falcon wing doors or right. whatever, but like square, two box, you know, three row SUVs. Um, those are really hot in this market. So really, when you come down to it, that's kind of what Rivian is these days. It's kind of they're filling in those little the, the blanks in the Tesla model uh, model line of let's. And, and when you look at these vehicles, right? I mean, we, we've we've tested the the pickup truck right. and, and, and now looking at the three row SUV. It feels very Tesla. Yeah, it really does. Um, you know, I mean, it was almost like the infotainment system was almost kind of like yeah. The steering wheel controls are the same, basically. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the same frustrations or conveniences, <laughs> either way, but very similar. You know, it's funny you bring that up, Jay, because it's almost like they they must have known that going in that we're going to find. I mean, you'd think they said we're going to go where Tesla isn't, right? I mean, like, how did they or or did they just guess? that Tesla wasn't going to have a pickup by by now or they weren't going to have because like you said, yes, the the Model X is a three row SUV, but it's not a very practical three row SUV by any stretch of the imagination. Right. So they they kind of just slid in there they, well, where they Tesla did. isn't. It, and they have a lot of time because I mean, Tesla, you know, they telegraphed our product line right. way ahead. Right? right. I mean, they've been talking about, you know, the Roadster and the and the Cybertruck cyber for truck years, for, yeah. and it's still not here. So it, it's very clear where they're heading, and they're right. like, "Hey, there's this giant market for three row SUVs and pickup trucks. Let's jump on it. Let's jump on it." Yeah. Uh, okay. So you talked about some of the kind of Tesla stuff, but there's some non Tesla stuff as well. You know, well, Tesla has some gimmicks with some of their cars. We've talked about it before, and. Rivian has sort of some gimmicks or features, whatever way, you, whatever you want to call them, such as the same things we saw in the uh, the R1T pickup, 
rechargeable LED flashlight that's tucked away in the driver's door, a removable rechargeable Bluetooth speaker that's underneath the center console, and there's an onboard air compressor with a hose. And Joe, just first of all, are they gimmicks or are they actual valuable features? And let's start with one that I think probably is valuable, which is the air compressor. And tell people why why would you put an air compressor on a vehicle like this? Yeah, I think, yeah, there is a value to it depending on how well it, how well it works or how long it lasts, depending on, you know, I don't know, you know, you wonder, there's a lot of aftermarket air compressors. Is it as good as that? I don't know. But yeah, you run into a situation, especially if they're marketing it for like off-road use or whatever, exactly. you can run into a situation where you may push the bead off, lose some air, whatever yep. it may be, have a puncture. And you do want that, you know, capability of being able to inflate out in wherever you are off on a trail is pretty, pretty or, big deal. Or if you air down, so to speak, you know, a lot of times in really serious off-road situations, which I don't know anyone would take their $80,000, $95,000 yeah. yeah. in a series, but you know, quite often true off-roaders like let some air out of the tires when yeah, they get into these situations. So then they, with this onboard air compressor, they can air it back up when they head back out to the road, which is kind of neat. But what about these other things, Jake? Bluetooth, um, speaker, <laughs> flashlight, so, so, like so, you don't, you, you, you couldn't buy any of those yourself, so, right? So, so let's, 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 let's talk gimmicks, right? Okay. And, 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 you know, one person's gimmick is the other person's surprise and delight and doing product <laughs> differentiator and all these different things. And yes, we talk about Tesla, which has everything from video games to, you know, karaoke and whatnot, right. or fart noises, uh -huh. of course. I knew you were going to say it. You got to call that out. <laughs> and um, certainly, look, the Rivian ones make a lot more sense in the context. I mean, there's also like, you know, uh, we didn't even talk about the camping mode where it where will, you know, adjust the, the yeah, you know, level for you, the so, level yeah. for you if you're sleeping in the car or whatever. But, you know, I. You could probably afford, you know, a, a nice setup if you could afford this car. Anyway, be, beyond that. Um, but here's the thing. Um, look, this is nearly a hundred thousand dollar vehicle and you could go get a, you know, an 88 Civic and put in the <laughs> trunk a Bluetooth speaker, a air compressor, um, rechargeable <laughs> flashlights, all for less than a hundred bucks. I mean, honestly, there's other ways to do this. I mean, you could put a little, you know, cubby in the back and put your own stuff with some USB charging right. and you'd be all set. So, so I mean, to differentiate, differentiate such an expensive vehicle by literally a couple of things, you go and get it, you know, the corner rod, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. the Mart. <laughs> so, so not really beyond, the, I mean, being a three row SUV that's electric, that's still fairly new, but it does, it's not breaking ground the way the pickup did in a sense. So like with that gear tunnel and stuff like that. I mean, that's, they just did some really cool things with that. This one has most of those same things. Yeah. But nothing really it's groundbreaking. A three row SUV, it's a yeah. three row SUV. Yeah. You know, there's nothing really game changing about it other than, yes, it's a, big boxy uh, SUV, which is surprisingly absent from the market. And Joe, mm -hmm. that's really quick. I mean, yeah. 835 horsepower. Just yeah. give people an idea of what it's like to floor it, you know, yeah, put I feel that like, throttle you know, pedal all the way to the, the floor when you get all that power at once. Yeah. So like in the past, when you're driving, you know, traditional cars, you actually like travel to the speed you're trying to get at with these EVs. You just go directly to the speed you're at. It feels like, you know, it's like slingshot effect or right. you feel like you're driving a laser beam, not a car really. But yeah, it, it gets to 60 and I would assume similar to the truck. So it's going to get to 60 in around four seconds, just under four seconds, which is quick yeah i mean fast. you can feel if you floor it which i i'll be honest uh it's i haven't gotten bored yet of at from low speeds just flooring the, the accelerator pedal because it's you know we for years journalists have talked about you know all oh, this pins you back into your seat these types of evs truly do pin you back into your seat and you can feel the tires like squirming try, trying to get any little bit of traction but and it does a great job putting that power down when you think about it. Yeah, if you look at our track, actually <clears> where <throat> I do the launches from 60 or, you know, doing our quarter mile, five, 500 meter runs, you can see rubber down on the track, but the wheels are never spinning. They're just right at that limit of where they're just scrubbing, like most efficient way to put the power down, but right. it's putting those tires like to the to the ultimate test right, right. there. I, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> throw out just counterpoint. Um, you know, I mean, it goes back to the old adage that it's, it's much more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow. And 
I don't know how great of an idea is this giant behemoth of a vehicle going zero to 60 in four seconds and they be on. I, I actually was driving um, the other day, I took out, you know, in, in our lot, we're done test, you know, but the uh, the GT86, the GR86, the, the GR86, the um, yeah, they keep on changing the, the name Toyota. on it, yeah, you know, the, the to- Scion, yep, you know, yep, yeah, the Scion FRS, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I took I took that out and, you know, it's it does not go zero to 16 four mm-hmm. seconds. Um, anything near that, but it's really fun because you got to work in order to do it. Right. And this is effortlessly goes so fast that it's like, you don't have time to engage when you drive a manual, you (laughs) have like six seconds to engage with the vehicle. This is like, yeah, it's four, but it feels like just a blink of an eye. Really? It's like a quantum gauge, right? It's like, I'm stopped and now I'm going 60 and now I'm going a hundred, you know, your speed (laughs) moves in chunks of 10 mile an hour increments. You don't see these gradual like increases in speed. I'm not going to say I, I can't sit here and say that it's not thrilling to floor that thing right i'm not going to say that and now you're talking acceleration versus handling and yeah gr86 no I'm, BRZ. I'm talking acceleration i'm like oh. it's more fun well you know it's it's a it's just i mean you would this thing it's amazing but here's here, <laughs> here's what i will say i think where you're sort of going with it besides the fact that maybe it's not as fun for some people and also i miss the i miss the engine sound too i, I really do i miss sure. uh, uh the revving high and everything but i think where you're sort of going is Maybe this isn't the smartest thing for a vehicle <laughs> this heavy to be able to accelerate that quickly. Just anyone can get it, get in the car, get in the truck and just floor before it, you know it before, you know, it. and that was the other thing that, so the power is amazing. It's awesome. And when you're doing like a, say you're on a two lane road and, and you need to get around slower traffic and you punch it all the way to the floor, which you don't need to, to do this sure. because it has so much power. If you do, by the time you're through that passing zone, you are going ridiculously yeah, oh, yeah. so there is something i think where you're sort of going jake is that maybe these aren't the smartest this isn't the smartest way to do an electric vehicle yeah well i mean the question is you know i mean obviously we're in the business of rating vehicles and you know we have a whole lot of different metrics and you know a lot of these you know again like if this went zero to 60 in six seconds would that be kind of fast enough to get into traffic oh yeah you know is it that much better that it goes zero to 60 in four seconds i mean for some people it's ridiculous it's an amusement park ride <laughs> yeah. but you know, does that make it it's safe for your family? Too, right. When you're competing with other manufacturers, it just seems it's, sky's the limit in terms of acceleration. It's like, who's going to be the one to say enough is enough. It's, I don't, it's I don't rights. know. Yeah. Well, it's and kind of funny because I, get it. Years, I love it. It wasn't that many years ago <laughs> that there was like this horsepower war, whether right. it was and torque wars with, uh, you know, uh, with the diesel pickups and everything. And everyone mm. thought, when are these horsepower wars going to end? And then it seemed like, oh, maybe they are going to start ending. And now they're just doing the same thing with the EVs. They're just totally. going to do the exact same thing. But Sticking with it, there are even with how quick it is and whatever, there's actually some issues with the way that the power mm-hmm. is delivered, right? And can you speak a little bit, either one of you, that just the, the kind of the abruptness that, that yeah. has to do with the regenerative braking, right, Joey? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, first, there's the regen issues, but I'll start with acceleration in the throttle or accelerator, whatever we're calling it now, being a little touchy, where you're rolling in. And then you're kind of, you almost get this little bit of like, uh, you're scared because as soon as the power hits, it's pretty hard. So you're trying to, you know, almost, you want to creep right. and it's very difficult to do that in slower situations. And as well as with regen, it's almost like the polar opposite where you're trying to come to a stop smoothly and the brake pedal you'll find just has a excessive travel and it's a little touchy too. So as soon as you finally get feedback, you get too much feedback and it's kind of, you know, accelerators the same. Brake pedal is the opposite. Same right. frustrations in a different. It, it, it's spectrum. kind of just jerky. You right. know? Yeah, it's very difficult, especially right. if you're trying to, you know, gently get around like a garage space exactly. or something like That's that. That's when it's at its it, worst. Is in the low speed much. situations. Right. Yeah. So it, it's funny because this they have two different levels of regenerative braking that you can set it to standard and and high, but they're both you know same. high and higher yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. Worse right? and worse. And <laughs> you know. One pedal driving, which it, this is capable of, which is basically you can come to a stop without ever having to touch the the actual physical brake pedal. And that's possible to do with this truck in either of its modes. And no question, one pedal driving with the regenerative braking does take a different mindset, right? Mm-hmm. A different driving yeah. style. You have to be smoother. You have to be thinking about it because we're so used to regular gas cars, right? You just, when you're even thinking about slowing down, you just let off the accelerator pedal and it and basically coast. keeps you're going. Yeah. Exactly. But with this. And in many electric cars, you have a mode where you can do that too. Right. And, and they don't have smooth. that here. And and you don't. Th- That's a mistake, right? I, I, I really do think it is. I think a lot of people will get into it and be turned off 
because they'll want, and no, certainly there's the one pedal drive, you know, thing. And some people like that and, and it works, but there's a lot of people who don't want that jerkiness and to not give you that selection. Although it turns out there is that selection. We have and breaking news today. Breaking you found news. a hack for this a I, totally abrupt throttle. Tell I, us what I, it is. I, I am very, um, I, I have to admit, I actually read a, the uh, the manual very, very. Uh, no, you did deeply. not. I no did. Way. I know. I'm the, I I'm the only one. <laughs> but um, you can turn off that regen, that heavy regen, and there's one way to do it: is you have to go into a snow mode. So if you go into snow mode, you have the option of really having a very low regen or no late regen where right. you could actually coast it like a normal car. Really? So, so I'm driving the car around in snow mode in, you know, 70 degrees. <laughs> and I'm like, this is actually way more pleasant. I was going to say, is there a downside? It doesn't appear to be. So okay. you go and you, you could see in some of the modes, for instance, you go in sport, you could see like the range changes right. and whatnot. Right. And, and it didn't really seem to change much wow. at all. So I'm like, I think I would drive this car around a snowboard really? because, you know, it doesn't okay. make my passengers nauseous when I constantly yeah. slow down every time I'm off the throttle. So there's, there's a tip for everyone, yeah, right? Yeah, winter like, all year round. <laughs> How do right. I hack your Rivian? Yeah. yeah. I don't, I, one pedal drive is, I try to get used to it, but I, I don't like it. I just feel like every, they should just, like you mentioned, they should just have the options to be able to sure. utilize coast because I love that's how I usually, that's how I prefer to drive. One pedal drive, I find myself always like misjudging the stop, getting off the pedal too early and then having to roll back on or right. then touching the brake too soon, getting back to the throttle and just well, frustrating. And here's another thing that I recently realized that I had a sneaking suspicion was the case, but I am now pretty darn positive is the case, which is that they, when there's a certain, and Jake, you can probably speak more to this, but when the, the vehicle is braking through regen braking up to a certain amount of, of force, the brake lights have to come on. Either they have to come on or everyone puts them on. Well, right. so what I found is I'm all think I'm doing this, you know, one mm -hmm. pedal driving, never having touched the brake pedal. Well, what is happening actually is the brake lights are coming on sure. a lot when I don't necessarily want them to. So but you're, you're on the highway and like you're flashing yeah, brake lights. I don't want to do that to people. So that is kind of a downside to especially one like this where it's really hard to just be very gentle with the accelerator pedal. So there are some downsides to it. And so I'm, I might be going, cause I've been this big, I love trying to see if I can get it to stop, you know, to let off the accelerator pedal at the exact right point mm. to then let it come to a stop. <laughs> it's, a with lot this. Of, it's a lot of distraction and work, yeah. really. It's a lot of work. And I it's think a game, I'm done it's with like it. It's like hypermiling when yeah. you really focus right, on right, trying right, to right. get the you best You just called me a nerd, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. You, you called me a nerd. Big nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of nerdiness, Joe, let's talk about, I know you love track handling. I know that, uh, I don't know why that's nerdy. That's not nerdy at all. But speaking of <laughs> this thing, I mean, speak to just how sort of crazy it is that this big heavy vehicle can handle as well as it does assuming you agree that it does handle yeah pretty well. it does it handles real well it actually because you know you have lower center of gravity with the battery and it stays very flat there's not that much body roll the steering is pretty responsive but yeah i feel in the just as fast as it, as it is like when you're on our track you're getting from between turn to turn like the straightaways in between really quickly so you find right. yourself actually you can misjudge a turn if you don't you know you have to know to let up earlier because these cars go so fast but yeah handling in general is pretty pretty impressive for a vehicle that weighs what almost like seven thousand pounds it's really heavy i, yeah, I, I think heavy. what happened is that the people who are who used to be in charge of making like sports cars they're all working on evs now <laughs> And yeah. certainly, I mean, with Rivian, I mean, actually, if you go back in history, they were looking at making sports cars, but, but these are today's sports cars. And, and you know, what's really weird just to throw it out. I mean, not a lot of electric sports cars are there because they right. don't need to be right. I mean, what the, the high performance sports cars of the day now are sedans by yeah. Tesla, SUVs and pickup trucks by Rivian. And I mean, why not make Hyundai? them though? It's like you don't need to. Because you, if you might as well have four doors, if you can well, and that's, add the practicality. And that's kind of. so, so if you think about a sports car, right? Like, uh, this is, we're going to go way off script here, but <laughs> there's no script. Let's just get real. But um, sports cars are made in a certain way to be low to the ground so they handle better and low center of gravity, right? right. When you got an EV, it doesn't matter if you're an SUV or a sedan. You got a low center of gravity because you get that big battery at the right. bottom. Yeah. So that's why all these SUVs are really sports cars. So they don't need to make those compromises yeah. because they have low center of gravity. They're that's a good point. unbelievably quick. Yeah. Um, they could put the power down. I mean, they're doing all the sports car stuff, but yeah. just with the body of whatever you want on it. Except the funny thing about this one, Joe, is that 
The truck, the R1T rode pretty well. Yeah. This thing, I think it rides worse, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty... Like a sports car. Yeah, yeah it's, it is. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's firm. There's a lot of impacts that just punch right through and some, you know, it's pretty unsettled for what you would expect out of most SUVs that are, you know, pretty compliant. This thing Absolutely. is, it feels like, like we say it again, a sports car type, you know, ride comfort. I think it rides rougher, uh, less refined than most SUVs out there, honestly. And I, I think this would, be, it would be, again, we, we still, it has to go through our whole test program and everything. But I think that would, for me, that would be a big sticking point. But maybe the bigger sticker sticking point might be controls. And I know, Jake, you love to talk about controls. Oh, geez. Let me just... So we have a first drive of the R1S up on our website, consumerreports.org. And John Linkov, friend of the podcast, wrote, the R1S's interior controls are identical to those of the R1T, meaning they also mirror Tesla's overall approach of shove it all in the center screen, <laughs> <laughs> which I think totally captures. Tell us, like, why of all things that you copy, why would someone copy Tesla's controls? Well, I mean, look, I, I think a lot of, it, it's almost like they want to get that Tesla customer. Mm. So, I mean, say you had, I mean, there's a lot of people who have a Tesla Model 3, right? I mean, that's yeah. a very common vehicle. And a lot of people are like, okay, maybe I don't want a small sedan. I want to move up to a three-row SUV or a pickup truck. So I think it's more about just someone who's going to hop into that one and feel like, Totally comfortable. Wow, this is the same kind of environment. Yeah, they already know what to do. It's like getting they a do. phone. These phone manufacturers that kind of copy each other, where you know they're gonna, you can kind of already be comfortable getting the newest phone or version of that. Right. It's kind of you already, you know, it's easy, easy to get used to. I, I think it's just you know, it's it's that mindset. So it's just kind of like just it's almost like in the, the same product portfolio. Yeah, you know, and um, you know, again, it's not it's not as bad as right. that i mean look there is a screen in front of the driver you know yep. unlike on the tesla model 3 and the tesla model y you yep. have you have that but it is super familiar you know in terms of how it how that big screen functions and like like joe said like you have everything from the steering wheel and how you adjust the mirrors and yeah, how you adjust that, the steering wheel it's like oh it's a carbon copy and of they're the unlabeled steering wheel buttons that's well, what that gets tesla, me tesla does right it, so exactly. you got to do so, that too. i mean the fact that you have to go through the touch screen first if you want to make an adjustment to the to yeah. the steering wheel, to the power steering wheel or the mirrors, you have to first go through the touchscreen to say that's what you want to do, and then you do the you do the yep. adjustments with the steering wheel controls, which are unlabeled. That said, they show you on you know on the screen which way to move yeah, it. You're but playing a video game. I can adjust your steering wheel and mirrors. And so and same with the adaptive cruise control, right? Like it, the, it, the, it, well, I can't remember which one. <laughs> wait, uh, which side is the volume? Which side is the if, <laughs> if you drove the speed? A Tesla Model Three for for four years. You'd be totally fine. So that's my and, and actually yeah. engaging the the crews, the after crews, and the lane centering. It's same the exact way. same way yeah. as on a the Tesla. double tap on the. So it's about familiarity yeah. and where you're what you're comparing to. Well, I mean, yeah. The assumption is you're not moving you, from a Highlander to this. You're moving from a, a Tesla. And it's this. cool to know what those <laughs> controls do without other people knowing, right? You're oh, in a, you're kind of secret handshake. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You're in the club. Maybe it's that. You're not in the club, Mike. Sorry. I'm I'm totally not in the club. Uh, also, just from a safety standpoint, I think it's in, insane that the that the emergency flashers button. This is one of my. Everyone has their pet peeves, right? Gabe has his. <laughs> Gabe Shenhar's is is lumbar support. Mm -hmm. Mine apparently is 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 uh, emergency flashers buttons that are in weird locations, and yeah. it's up on the center console. You would. The purpose of an emergency of the emergency flashers is we need you to press them because you need to tell someone behind you, hey, slow down. And I don't want to be fiddling around. Right. That's just stupid. Right. But um, I will say at least the seat heater buttons are always on the touch screen visible you can always mm -hmm. get to them which in you know there's some cars where you can't even do that so there's a lot to talk about with this r1s and we have a lot more information up on our website consumerreports.org a full first drive uh and it the r1s is going into our test program very soon it's just about up to our break-in miles and then stay tuned obviously for the full road test results uh as soon as we're done with that so with that, let's move on to the audience question of the week. Folks, don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30-second video clips at TalkingCars at iCloud.com. That's the best way to reach out and talk to us. And, you know, we do love those videos. Um, and wouldn't you know, we have one this week. This is from Scott in Winnipeg, Canada. So let's roll that clip right now. 
Hi, Talking Cars. I just have my Subaru Forester in for service and it's making me look forward to when we are going to be replacing our 2013 Toyota Highlander in the fall. We are looking for something that would be at least a 5,000 pound towing capacity, but something more fuel efficient. And that is seeming to be something that is hard to find. I have looked at the XC90 plug-in hybrid as well as the Grand Cherokee 4xe. Uh, but neither of those rank very well on your reliability rankings. I've also looked at the possibility of the 2024 Grand Highlander, but I'm concerned that it won't have the fuel economy that we're looking for. Anything that you could point us towards would be greatly appreciated. Thanks so much and keep talking cars. All right. So I always love when people end their videos with and keep on talking cars. I, so thanks, Scott, for that. That's kind of a neat thing people do. Uh, so, Joe, this yeah. is not an easy question. He basically admitted that. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe almost a unicorn is what can you how can you help him i think the best thing he can do maybe is do nothing and kind of stick with what he's got because what do you do when you're kind of making all the correct decisions or doing what you should be or what we think you know and um kind of just ride it out and see what comes out down down the road wait for um the newer highlander or wait for yeah just the grand highlander yeah, that's or, a, yeah. the grand highlander well, yeah, yeah, I feel like it. I don't know. There's something to, to be said about just doing nothing when you have a decent option. I know he wants better fuel economy, but when you're kind of already getting the best of what you're going to get, maybe, I don't know, you just be complacent with it. Yeah. Jake? So first of all, auto manufacturers, if you're listening, make this guy a car. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. really, you know, he's right. Um, you know, when you go to the hybrid uh, SUVs, you're usually cut to 3,500 pounds. Right. Why not? figure out how to make the thing pull 5,000. If that means a little bit more powertrain cooling, then so be it. Um, but I'm, I'm with Joey over here. Um, you know, look, you've got yourself a, a Highlander. Um, you know, those at, at around 10 years, they're just starting to get broken in. They have a long life. I think the one thing you could start thinking about, I mean, we, we, we talk mountain bikes, right? I mean, you know, you, you have a mountain bike, and you have a road bike, right? And yeah. you wouldn't want to do a triathlon, you know, road race on your mountain bike. No. Why not have the right tool for the right, right job? And I know it's difficult sometimes to have multiple cars, but, you know, maybe the right answer is go get an EV for your everyday driving or commuting. Keep that Highlander. Don't rack the miles up on it. Only use it when you do need to tow, when you do need to go on that trip. But think about what you need daily. So a lot of times we do see that. People will get an EV and something for those trips and have the right tool for the right job if, if you could afford that. But again, in terms of affording, you might be a whole lot better off keeping this older Highlander and getting a more affordable EV than trying to get that vehicle that somehow does everything. How about an EV for towing? Yeah, I would avoid that. But <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have a story on that no. that I'm sort of I'm sort of hinting at, which we just recently. I want you to finish what you're going to say, Joe. Be very patient. We 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 just did a, a story. It's up online where we towed a 10,000 pound trailer behind a Rivian R1, our Rivian R1T, and mm -hmm. our Ford F150 Lightning, and the results were kind of amazing. Like they did a great job towing in sure. most ways, lots of power, but the driving range went down to less than a third of yeah. what the EPA rates them at. So towing, yes. Long range towing, no. They're not even close to there yet. If, if right. you're just towing around You'll town, no problem. You'll spend more time charging than you will. Exactly. Um, and think towing. about trying to pull that big rig into a, you know, a DC fast charging right. location. But you were going to say something. Yeah. I, I, I guess in terms of back to his question, there's always, you know, you got to ask yourself, he's trying to compromise between two things, right? And He's got to just think about, you know, what's more important to him. And then that can start leading him down maybe other routes if he does want to just pursue actually getting something, whether it be fuel economy or fuel efficiency or, um, yeah, towing. So what's more important to him? I, I kind of came up with sort of the same thing you guys are saying, except what I thought was, well, he said he wanted better fuel economy than his 2013 Highlander. So 2023 Highlander with the Turbo 4. Yeah. Uh, gets, you know, better fuel economy uh, than his did back in 2013 and can still tow 5,000 pounds. So he could also go that route. Sure. Uh, it's not rated for more than 5,000 pounds and 2022 or whatever it gets is not amazing. Mm -hmm. MPG, uh, I'm sure that's not what he's looking for. And but it is one thought he could just get a, a newer Highlander, get better fuel economy than what he's currently getting and still be able to tow. So that's one option. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Not bad. 
Uh, all right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you want to learn more about the topics and the cars that we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. Don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video clips to talkingcars at iCloud.com. This episode was produced by Dave Abrams and edited by Anatoly Shumsky and Andrew Belize. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you all next week.